So you look good. You seem good. Thank you. You may have, uh... Ten years, man! Ten! Where have you been for ten years? Let's get into it. One, two, three. And can you see me? Oh, I don't know what happened there. Yeah. But we're we're right. back now, so that's good. So yeah, that's good. I, think yeah, I don't know. That was just enough to scare everyone. It's just you getting a black yeah. screen for the rest of the night, just listening to a void. So, uh, like we were saying before, welcome on Whiskey Den. Everything is working perfectly fine here tonight. So we're glad to see you here. Um, smooth as nails. Smooth as nails. <laughs> our, our favorite public access whiskey review show where craft whiskey is king. And tonight is no different because we are talking once again with our good friend Cullen Keegan about Daddy. this who's been around in the whiskey industry now for a decade, a 10 year anniversary this year. That is really, really huge. And he also came out with this lovely blue bottle that he finished his whiskey, a uh, three year whiskey in Pedro Amena's cast for a year. So that is something we're gonna be tasting here in a little bit and I'm not gonna lie, I already have some in my glass. So what is everyone in the chat drinking? What, what, what are you drinking tonight, uh, Colin? I'm actually drinking the same thing. Um, actually, you know what? <laughs> this is weird. We released this at 100 proof, and um, we had four test small bottles at 92, 98, 100, and 104. We knew it would be somewhere in that range. I think I'm drinking the 104 at the moment with some water added. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking the old backstock. <laughs> the bottle that everybody else is drinking. I, I remember when you had those out. I think I voted for 104. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we got uh, we got some good feedback from lots of people. Exactly. When you offer whiskey to people, come in and drink some whiskey. Yeah, you get lots of people showing up. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> well, free whiskey, I should say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like we were saying, you guys celebrated your 10 year anniversary this year, and oh. before we get too much into it, you guys did come out with this release. Um, yeah. Now what went into this what went into the thought process of finally coming out with this release i just want the fans to know a little bit more about what's going on out there uh, out there with this release i don't want to i don't want to yeah, short change it no th this is uh it's a lot of what we're getting into in the whiskey world within within craft i mean it's a small small world there's probably 50 distilleries doing this kind of stuff where we're lucky if we've got stock we can do something interesting. Um, I, I'm going to be really self-promoting and talk about all the whiskeys. This is the regular Carl Keegan. This is a mesquite smoked single malt, third of the grain smoked, and, a th uh, and two thirds is unsmoked, obviously. And a third of it is aged in new oak, and two thirds in used bourbon cast, like most other mm -hmm. whiskeys, uh, Scotch style whiskeys, anyway. And that's how we start. This is a 15 cask blend because some of it's smokier, some of it's oakier. We put about 15 casks together. To be honest, that's the size of our mixing vessel by the time we water it back. So there's, there's, it start, all starts like this. Actually, it all really starts like this because this is cask strength. When we actually, before the blend, we have to taste everything. It's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. come on down to New Mexico. Maybe not this week. Um, <laughs> numbers. But so it's all, all the casks are like this. This is one that just screams, leave me alone. So we leave it as a single cask. It's got a balance of the oak and the smoke and the vanillas and the leathers and the cinnamon and all the rest of it, the fun stuff that we have in there. We had a big success when we released Col Keegan, a minimum mm -hmm. three year blend with an extra year in apple brandy casks. We make an apple brandy, and this is the um, app, this is the whiskey, the Col Keegan, 15 casks blended together, still a single malt, just all single malt, just to preach to the choir, it means one grain, one distillery. So we blend mm -hmm. 15 casks, and then we put it back into apple brandy casks to make 
this whiskey. So this has got a sort of slightly sweeter, I think you guys have tried it, sweeter yeah. note. Yeah. And we thought, well, you know, it'll be a special release. And we <laughs> we can't fill those casks fast enough for the apple brandy, <laughs> which is a shame. We've got tons of Colgegan, but we keep having to pull it out and put it in apple brandy casks. Um, and because of that, and because of the interest, and everybody got excited, for 10 years, we decided to do something special, spend a little bit of money, and the real little bit of money was we, we didn't actually bring it over from Portugal. We went to a broker who said, I've got some Pedro Jimenez casks for you, and, uh, which is great. I mean, if you drink sherry, try Pedro Jimenez sherry. It is quite awesome. To be honest, not a huge amount of the flavor always carries over, you know, into whiskeys and stuff, but mm -hmm. we think in this case it did. Now, we did, like most people flavoring whiskeys, had to rechar the cask. Now, okay. those casks instead of 53s are 60 gallon casks, so they're a little bigger. And um, we got two of them. So we made 120 gallons, and with Angel Share, and I think what we might call distiller's cut. I think every week, every week he went home with a little bit in his pocket. But now I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good. So we ended up with um, what was it, 92 cases of it. Not a huge amount. That's six bottle cases. So uh, very happy with the way it turned out. You can see it's got a darker color than most of the Carl Keegans, if you know our mm -hmm. stuff, and a darker color than most Scotch style whiskeys or American yeah. single malt style whiskeys. So, um, yeah, there you go. Patrick's got a good, good show on there. Um, it, uh, that was something we decided after 10 years, we deserved to play a little, which is what this was. We did something and it's, it's done well. I mean, it's done very well for us. Uh, you know, the first weekend we sold something like 200 bottles and it doesn't sound like a lot if you're in the dis distribution world, but in the distilling world, that's a lot to sell. Considering yeah. every we had a little party, we had eight of them because we could only have six people in the distillery at a time. So we yeah. brought them in, they all had a sample, they all bought a bottle basically, or two or three bottles, and then they, they left. Then we sprayed everything down, COVID, etc., and then had to do it again and again. So it was sort of trial by fire, and um, it, it's come out okay. <laughs> I thought that was something I was going to bring up. I loved how you guys still had, you guys still tried to have like a release party for it, but it was done uh, very, very well for anyone trying oh, to go you. that was concerned. Yeah. Like, I'm like you, you got your table, you got a little group, you were sectioned <laughs> off from someone, you got to have your taste. I think it was like an hour and a half or maybe a two hour time section, which yeah. it, once you become an adult, adult, that that section of time's okay for being off on a week, you know, a weekend yes, or a week. There you go, yeah. <laughs> Start catching me there for three or four hours, it could be a problem. Yeah. Um, or it could be an oh, Uber home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I thought that was an excellent way to still try to bring the community in, in spite of in what's everything that's going on around you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought that was awesome. Um, so before we get too much into the history and 10 years that we want to talk about, mm -hmm. I want Mike and Ben to start are giving me some, oh. some I haven't reviewed this for anyone in the chat yet so uh, I, I want to give I, I want to get a little tasting notes here or some some smelling notes from then Bef before we go I, I just want the fans to get a little smell of it <clears throat> because like when I first had this the other day it was I, I was surprised by all the different layers that were in here but then last night I had the cask strength and this together with my friend because so I was letting them taste them and then this got, after I went to cast strength and came back to this, it got a little spicier that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was crazy, but I loved it. And I rambled, so I'll let Mike and Ben talk. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> mm. I get, I, I very heavy, like, first thing I get hit with is, is just a, a very deep, dark fruit. Yeah. I'd agree with that one, definitely. Like, I, when I popped the cork on the, the cork on this i got like this rich dark ch like dark cherry not the maraschino cherry but the dark cherry and yeah. like a chocolate smell just off the 
when I popped it out, it like yeah. came walking out. Mm -hmm. That faded a bit once it got to my glass, but I was going to say that was so overwhelming when I first popped the cork. It was like, I don't know. So kind of I, I've got a question for you. This is, this, this is also smoked, correct? Yeah, this starts as Carl Keegan. So there is a smoke in there. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely at the start, as is our regular smoked mesquite Do smoke. You so I was wondering, do you do you keep track like you know like like with peat smoke or you know the parts per million that they track in there? Mm -hmm. Do you keep track of your the, like the smoke level or just say we want this one to be smokier, less smokier? Or you do everything the same smoke level? Everything starts well. We to be honest, we don't track it. We had it tested once, and it was what was it? I think it was like sixty parts per million. Whereas a Lagavulin is something like, it was a Lagavulin 120, something like that. Mm -hmm. something and if you go, all, I mean, you can go all the way to like Optimal from Bucladic to up to 300 <laughs> or so. Yeah. That'll, you know, just, you start making your coffee in the minute you're drinking, you know, it's like wood, wood, wood. <laughs> and I, I feel like I'm underground already, um, which I, which I do like actually, <laughs> yes. especially these yeah. days. But um, we haven't really tracked it, but everything starts with, a thousand pounds sorry two thousand pounds of grain into the mash ton 666 pounds of that is mesquite smoke okay and really it's depending on how much it off gas is it has a little bit to do with temperature in and around mm -hmm. the distillery and how we make it and stuff but because we blend 15 cats it sort of brings it back to that but probably always in the maybe 60 parts per million no, that's okay. cool. And even on a 30%, that's still pretty sweet. Yeah, no, it is. I, I agree with the dark, sort of deep, dark fruit, you know, sort of cherries and mm -hmm. plums and it's, yeah, maybe it, it, overripe plums, which doesn't sound particularly good, but I think in this case it works. Yep. No, the, the, way it, the, the way it strikes me is, uh, I, although I am, I'm well, not proudly fat, but I'm fat. I've, I've seen my share of pastries. <laughs> but when, but when, you, when, you, when you watch like a... You watch like a real a, a great chef make something like this delicious, and you look at this pastry and you're like, this this smells like like one of those looks. It's yeah. like okay, I'm 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 in for a treat, and I and and it's just going to be just so deep and rich and thick with everything. But I get a, there's a little bit of, it's not a pastry, but but like a baked good, um, mm -hmm. off of there too. Yeah, but I, I do it. I do yeah that the chocolates. I didn't get the chocolate the first time that I had it, and then. Uh, ben had said uh, on on one of the the tasting notes, he's like, "Do you get this?" And then I was like, "Well, now I have to have more." <laughs> so <laughs> and I did, and, and 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 since then I get that. Now whether that's because it opened up or anything, but I get that on the nose and on the palate quite a bit. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I was gonna say I, on the nose, I I was getting besides the deep kind of darker raisin and a little bit of like molasses note to it. I was getting. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, a little bit of a cherry, which I think was a little bit of sherry note, even like an apricot, a little bit of orange, some brighter notes mixed in with some of the dark stuff going on um, on the nose. Sorry, Ben, what did you get? I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. I don't want to. Oh, we no. want to not have you get your five minutes of fame here. We want to get you in there. <laughs> five minutes and I'm gone. See you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. Yep. No, it's uh, it's really fantastic. It's if you're familiar with the Cole Keegan at all, for me, there's this just half a second right off the top, you get classic note of the Cole Keegan single malt with a little hit of that smoke, and then the sherry kind of comes in, and you get, uh, to me, it's like a, a syrupy raisin kind of note to it. Just I, I can think of golden raisins of dark raisins, and uh, like a dark molasses cake, almost like a fruit cake or a Christmas cake kind of thing going um and uh let's see i get that little hit of cherry a little hit of pear which for me the pear comes off almost yeah. like a, a williams like a, a brandy pear brandy yeah. um and there's a little hint of chocolate in there on the nose and then on the palate it's man it's mm -hmm. gorgeous what what i love about this is all right i'm a fan of the coke in anyway but this is like everything that's fantastic about that but it's it's like soft and rounded everything is mm -hmm. really soft and yes. round in this um especially with what the sherry did with the mesquite smoke in there it just uh kind of rounded it off and softened it in this just beautiful way and there's everything so integrated nicely and that chocolate note mike that was that was on the finish the 
the mm-hmm. mesquite was coming across um, almost like a mint. And so it was like a chocolate mint. Like if you popped an Andy's mint in your mouth, that's what the finish, what I was getting off the finish. And it was just absolutely lovely. <laughs> just, just really enjoying it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it, and it does it doesn't drink or nose like the proof. I, mean, oh. I I would not guess that this is that this is that this is hundred proof like it it's not at all and it's uh which again I think it all goes back to being very well balanced. I mean flavors and everything yeah. nothing's overpowering. Everything's just very I'll, well I'll, put together. I'll be honest with you. I can see this being me thinking this was wine proof. This is how I can see this being dangerous for me. In that level where it's like I just had it and I'm like there's a little something in there. I can I can have as much as I want tonight. Like we're, we're good to go. Um, but no, like on this, when I when I first tasted it, um, I got like a lot of big honey on the tongue, then the brown sugar, and then I started to swirl it with my tongue because it was night. It has a really nice silky kind of viscousy feel to it. It's mm-hmm. not overly done, but it has a nice little flow to it when you're moving it around. And that's when I was getting a lot of the berry notes kind of mixed in, um, like the plum, the pear, raisin. They're all kind of playing together at that point, mixed with like a caramel cream as you were kind of moving your tongue around. is all kind of flowing together. And then I was getting that little bit of hint of mesquite wood more in the background because I like, like you Ben was saying, like it, it really came a little more subdued in this one where the cast strength is the bit where it kind of grabs you a little bit shakes you yeah and i, and I like that i like i like being shook around a little bit this is the other side of it where it's very nuanced and i think you guys said your distiller chris you guys use the elevage elevage technique with this yeah. one mm-hmm. yeah and i was we've had a few of them because we've, we've talked with nancy fraley and had some from her oh, yeah. and some other places um i think i'm starting to notice some of the things that are very similar yeah. when people are using that technique um, like, uh, like Robert Licorice and other people down at Iron Root, they use it as well too. You get this very nice harmonious blend of everything kind of playing mm-hmm. together where mm-hmm. things rise up out of the whiskey, but they don't poke out. You know, there's nothing sharp or abusive or abrasive to it. It is all this nice rounded whiskey. Like Ben said, it really tamed down the smoke. Um, but you did get it in the back because I, I thought on the finish, I got like almost like a cherry lava cake with caramel <laughs> drizzled over it. Yeah. That smelled like it tasted like it was cooked over like a mesquite campfire, where like the smoke could just like penetrated the the, the cake yeah. a little bit in there just to kind of give you that hint. Uh, we, we have you on, and we, I mean, you knew we liked it beforehand, so I don't feel bad saying it. We're not kissing yeah. you. This was really, really nice. Colin. This, yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, thank you. you. Where I I know Ben was talking before, like cast strength being top five ish for the year, top ten, yep. top five ish for, for what we're for what we've had, and this is just like, this is the other side. Forgive me. This is the other side of the hand that slapped you from the cast yeah. strength. <laughs> this is the velvet glove that rubs your face instead of slapped yeah. you. Yeah. It's like you- a, a slap that way, and then yeah, oh, yeah come back with it. Yes, back. the velvet <laughs> glove, not the backhand. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So I, I, and this, I'm trying to think of a, of a way to say this. So it didn't sound, I don't know, shitty to some people, but if you had, if you had someone who was an absolute scotch snob that was like, Oh yeah. And Americans can't make this, whatever total snob. And I, and if you blindly gave this to them, I don't think they could tell that it was, I think they would think that it was a scotch. And I, I, and I, I, do, do, I don't mean that negatively towards you or anything, but you know, more towards them where it could, you're like this, there's no way this is an American single malt. Yeah. I, I think it, um, it's a heavier sort of deeper, uh, whiskey most definitely. And I, I think you're right. When you, when you get the mesquite smoke in there to the Scots who are really a sort of aficionados or snobs, whichever way you want to put it, <laughs> but they say aficionados, let's be nice to them. Because yeah. I'm going to try and tell uh, someday, but, um, they, um, they, they would spot mesquite smoke, but this, the, the sherry really plays against it. Mm-hmm. And I think you're right. It, it, it's like some of those, um, sort of flavored Macallans or Glen Morangis, you know, that have got all kinds of different finishes on them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It actually, it, and here's what, here's what I found interesting on the first, the first time I cracked the bottle and was having the taste as I was working through this, you know, 
pick out the mesquite smoke. Okay. But if I wasn't really focused on it intensely trying to determine, you know, break down what all the flavors are, what they were, it, it really comes across as uh, almost peat like there's, mm -hmm. there's a bit yeah. of a woody quality to it. Almost. I would call it like a Highland peat, not so much Isla or something like, but like a high, like you experience in a Highland peat, like even a little bit of Oban or uh climb leash or something like that. There's, mm -hmm. there's a, almost a peat like quality to it. There's an earthiness and there's a woodiness to it that, oh man, the way, the way it works with the sherry, I didn't get that out of the standard Cole Keegan or even the cast drink, but I get it out of this. And that's what I agree with Mike. It's like you hand this serve to somebody blind. My guess is their, their first guess is this is a scotch, you know, it's just got that, that quality to it. That's, oh man, just, it's really nice. It's really cool. The way that mesquite plays with the sherry like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think the two do complement each other, which, to be honest, we didn't even think about when we started this project. <laughs> but I think as we tasted it, oh, yeah, actually, they go. You know, sort of a yeah. sweet and a smokiness, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We luck out. Chris, Chris did a great job of pulling this off, I think. Well, it started with Stephanie, our distiller, and then, uh, you know, she moved on, and then Chris picked up the reins and uh, was watering back slowly and being an elevage. Well, so the same, like, and, and when you got Chris, he kind of took this project on, which is always, I don't, it's tough for someone, I think, who's coming in in the middle of, of sort of someone else's project, even if it is yeah. just the end of kind of twitching it. But I mean, I, he, I think he did a wonderful job with what you guys did with this. So, no, um, I mean, and speaking of that, I know that we've mentioned Chris, but is he is the new head distiller, am I correct? He is. He's, uh, he's our head distiller, has been. Poor guy, he moved from uh, Arizona to New Mexico to join us in late February because he really wanted to explore New Mexico. And then, of course, we've had <laughs> mostly lockdown since, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was March 19th when our state was completely locked down. So he got about two weeks in New Mexico while he was starting a new job, so he was busy. And... Um, He's been a trooper because we haven't, um, uh, uh, an assistant distiller just moved on and we didn't really know how we were going to make an income. So we couldn't hire anybody. So we kept every, we managed to keep everybody who was there. And Chris has done everything. He's used to sort of leading a group of distillers and he was doing it himself basically. Oh, so it was, a, it was a real, a, a different time. And in April and May, we were making a thousand gallons of hand sanitizer a week instead of whiskey. So he's, he's been through it and still managed to come up with a great product all through everything. Yeah. I think, wow. I think that's pretty sweet just to be able to have that transition happen very seamlessly like that. Uh, yeah. That, that's, that's really nice when that works out that way. But I think we were saying this is a 10 year anniversary. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's spend the, ten, the, the clock back. 10 years to before you started this um wh what was your goal when you first started it were you looking at I, I think you were just looking at more single malts um but i don't know what was the thing that really kicked you off to go down this path because i mean to get on it and then to stick with it for such a long time it is really yeah. impressive because i think we all know what's going what i thought was going to go on before and has been going on this year um to some other distilleries so we're we're just happy you've made it this far and are still around putting out wonderful products. Nice. But how did it all kick off for you? <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of people already know the story and I th I'm sure I told you guys it, um, you know, I was an architect and when nobody was calling to get their, you know, three, four, $5 million house on a golf course, um, I was looking for something to do. I needed a drink, but I couldn't afford one, so I decided to make one. Now, that's a slight <laughs> slight misconception. Um, I actually designed a house in an apple orchard. The project fell apart. My wife and I bought the orchard. That's actually where we are now. This is up, upstairs in the pitch, a little pitch roof that we got up here. And um, this is, I guess, my man cave these days because I need one because <laughs> not in the office that much. Um, and anyway, we're making apple brandy. And um, when some, somebody said, oh, I'll buy a bottle or two, I decided, oh, gosh, I better get a license. Goodness gracious, I'm a moonshiner. <laughs> I better stop that. And, uh, you know, better stop that moonshining nonsense. And um, really, uh, 
started putting together a business plan. We bought a building, bought a still, and it was going to be me five days a week, two days distilling, one day marketing, one day sales, and another day for catch up. Never, that never actually happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, we really decided, and I'd always, I'd grown for a love of single malt, grown into really. Um, God, wouldn't that be great? So we really did bought a still that was a, a brandy whiskey still. We can't make vodka on ours. It doesn't have enough plates. Uh, we do buy a vodka, process it, and sell a vodka. Got nine products. Um, that was way back in the beginning. So within 10 years, within the first two years, we sort of put some products together. Year three, we bought the building next door and expanded into that. Year four, we, we blew her through that and into the next one. They were condo units. So it's an industrial building, really long, long one. And we bought three of the end units out of the four. And um, then in 2016, two years after, three years after that, we bought the whole acre behind us. There's a weird rule in New Mexico. You can't move a distillery. So if you could became Jack Daniels, you'd have to shut down and start again because you couldn't do it in the same building. And obviously, it's not building. It. It's it's a weird law, but yeah, that, every that, state. That, that, we'll check that into the bullshit law category. Yeah, the we, bullshit we law across. category. You know. <laughs> oh, you can lobby against it if you like. Yeah, we meet every two years, and it takes about eight years to pass a law. No, forget that one. So, we I asked the state, "Can you go contiguous?" And they said, "Yeah, you can go to contiguous." They were trying to help, but the the ABC, the Alcohol Beverage Commission in New Mexico, has to follow the rules. I mean, I really don't hold it against them. It's just archaic laws. That's one of the ones in New Mexico. You guys are all from different states, and each one of your states has a weird law of some sort or other, you know. It just doesn't make any sense. Like Prohibition didn't, you know. I just yeah. I just licensed the distributors to be the Al Capones of this world. <laughs> oh, we're not going to go there. I love my distributor. Please don't drop me. <laughs> um, that might be the best analogy I've heard yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, it's yeah. Just think think through who makes the money in the liquor world. It's not the distillers <laughs> or the retailers. Anyway, yes. um, so yeah, we we're now in eleven states. That took a while to build up. We're actually focusing this year on four of them, unfortunately, for us and those states. But we all sort of have not even parted ways, just agreed we might come back to this when this is over, which <laughs> who knows, you know. Um, we're in Germany and Australia and Japan now. Oh, really? And, nice. Yeah, oh, yeah. Did I not mention that? No. no. Uh, the ja oh. Japanese no. love. Love some smoke on their whiskey. Yes, they do. Yeah. I think they think they're buying Scotch whiskey, by the way, but that, I'm not telling them. <laughs> yeah. I had a weird question. Are, uh, is it distilleries or is it just being distributed there? Because Japan has those weird laws where, like, you, they could be buying Cole Keegan and it could be Japanese next week. Yes. Um, <laughs> we don't sell any raw product to them. Okay. It wouldn't be cost effective to buy ours at our price point, empty it, and put, but. Um, yeah, the Japanese um, are unfortunately suffering because of their lax liquor laws that meant you could call it Japanese no matter what, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. And, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, Suntory has some great, great whiskeys. Oh, gosh. Yeah. We guys have all, all of us have tried some great, you know, Japanese whiskeys. And um, they didn't tighten the laws. They didn't think they needed to, and they wanted to keep some leeway. And some guys, our gals, whoever, you know, <laughs> just decided, yeah, we're, we're going to, you know, bend the rules to the very max. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was Canadian, and it, which is nice and soft, you know. I'm sure they got some Irish in there because there was a, a glut of Irish whiskey around for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, slap, slap a Japanese label on it. And um, it's coming back to bite them now because people aren't trusting, is this really Japanese? And they're having a – and the, the real group of distillers um, within Japan are like – if I could remember their names, I'd probably bastardize them to try and save them. So I'm not going to tell anybody here. But um, they're, they're trying very hard to reinitialize rules and regulations. Um, but what, a lot of what started it was they ran out. They, they yeah. were a victim of their own success. And they where can we get some more? Um, and they, 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 as a nation of whiskey makers, they're very patient. Yes. Most of them are. Some of them broke the rules. Well, I say broke the rules, bend, bend the rules. 
Yeah. And it, they're, they're having to sort of reinitialize those again. I think it, I think it's good that they get get the actual laws back in there because it will make their if they were to come up with their own category of I don't want to say legitimate Japanese but like <laughs> I think I think that would drive the price where it needs to be where some of them not yeah. some of the times now you're getting stuff and you're like was well, it really a 70 80 120 dollar bottle or is yeah. is you, yeah. I just don't believe it you know am I, am I having a now I've, yeah. I've have had some that I paid that much for, and I was like, "Oh, yep, this is damn delicious. This was yeah. this was exactly right." But I, yeah. I think you, you can spot them. I mean, the same way you can spot, you know, Irish whiskeys with a triple distillation or Scotch whiskeys. Scotch whiskeys sort of say, "This is whiskey," you know, and <laughs> they're, they're they're definitely category. I feel they're very differentiated, which I really like. You know, American bourbons are nice and soft, you know, because there's plenty of oak and you know, the mm -hmm. corn and stuff. But Japanese whiskey just have a <laughs> umami to them, you know, like a, a softer, sweeter, mm -hmm. just sophisticated note when they're really Japanese whiskeys. That's Colin's view. It's not the view of anybody else, you know. Yeah. So, all right, out of, out of the last 10 years, I, I guess what, one, I think it's great that you've been around this long. I mean, not everybody's going to be able to do that. So I, you're, you're clearly you're doing brown hair when I started, though. That's yeah. a problem. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that happens. But you still have hair. You haven't pulled it all out. Hair, yeah. <laughs> but are, what's aside from you know, really, twenty twenty shouldn't count because it's just a dumpster fire anyway. So aside yeah. from this year, what's been your biggest surprise of the last ten years of being in the industry? Oh gosh. Um... Biggest surprise. Mm -hmm. I suppose the fact that you have to keep, always keep thinking. Um, I, I thought we'd start this and we get to a point, we get some products, get some distribution, and then sort of follow a model of how to grow a small business. It's a very mm -hmm. difficult business and everybody will say that in business. For, forget 2020 for the moment. Um, in that, if you're not really huge, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to not worry about things on a day-to-day -day basis. I suppose that's the biggest surprise is sort of how difficult it is. You know, we've got to, we, there are fights at the moment, let's forget COVID, are keeping the direct-to-consumer conversation up so that we can do what wineries and, well, breweries can, but you don't want to ship that much weight of beer. But so that we can have the same as allowances wineries. Our federal mm -hmm. excise tax is a different fight. I've yeah. sort of moved into that because my distillers have managed to take over the real day-to-day -day operations and my, you know, salespeople and administrators and stuff. I say that, I, I keep saying S on the end of those. There's four of us in the distillery at the moment. <laughs> that, was, that was COVID. It was, yep. it, for distilleries, you've got to be very scrappy all the time. So it was, oh my God. Everything shut down. Okay, what do we do? Uh, let's, let's make hand sanitizer. Okay, now we're doing ready-to-drink cocktails. We do a Killer Manhattan, which we're just getting label approval for. When I get them all, you know, let everybody know. We can send out bottles and stuff. But um, it, it, I don't think it hit the distillers. It hit them hard. And in New Mexico, we, we, I think we're harder than how to hit them than a lot of others because we're so small. But we've been thinking hard and pivoting as everybody talks about this year, every single few months as a distillery. If it's not a distributor fight, it's a something or other. So I suppose that was the big surprise to it all, is that it's continual. Um, maybe that's just small business. Maybe I didn't know what that's getting into. <laughs> so, so is there a future in politics for Colin in uh, New Mexico? Is that coming down the road here? Uh, <laughs> I don't have a Z in my name. The, <laughs> Lopez <laughs> Martinez, you know, Vasquez. Um, but I think I could do a good job locally of sort of talking small business if the distilling thing falls apart. It's still a possibility for any of us. You never know what this last... For us, it's a lockdown. We were just talking before. New Mexico is one mm -hmm. of the two states that was one of the first to reinitialized everything's closed you know the curbside only at restaurants um grocery stores and gas stations are the only things that are still open really um, yeah. if that keeps going the way it's going things are going to change but 
if it all falls apart, I would love to lobby for small business. I'm still part of the chamber. Mm -hmm. It'd probably be more from a business angle than a political angle, mm -hmm. to be honest. That's um, fair. We, we we knew you were a little bit into that, you know. So yes. sometimes it sometimes like one thing leads to another, or right. yeah. or you're doing a good job at one, and then everyone's like, "Hey, we need you to do this." <laughs> <laughs> well, when you talk as weird as I do, it's Northern England, the accent. People ask me that all the time. I try and get away with Lubbock, Texas, but it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> but, um, you know, when you talk as weird as I do and you lobby for local business, I think you sometimes just by opening your mouth, you can do more harm than good. You're not local. You know? <laughs> but I've lived in Santa Fe 28 years now. Goodness gracious. Here's to Santa Fe. Cheers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cheers, so, yeah. Mm. Mm. So what are some of the highlights or big big memories over the last 10 years, things that, that have stood out for you? Um, I think the release of Carl Keegan was definitely one. You know, we started making whiskey and ah, let's, really, let's try it after a year. And you've all tried some craft distilleries that have tried to release after a year. In our case, it wasn't, wasn't right. Some can and some can't. Um, we waited three years. I had a distiller at the time called Nick, who was like, no, 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 no. And that's why it's good to employ people that can tell you, no, I'm not going to let you boss. I know you're the boss, but no. And he was right. We waited another year. That was very worth the wait. Um, I think actually being part of the board of ACSA mm -hmm. is a high point. I, that's some, uh, it's an organization I really believe in. I think they do a really good job of representing craft. Um, I'm on the craft advisory board. Or well, actually, I've just come off actually within the last week of the discus, and I think the highlight is actually watching discus, ACSA, ADI, and even WSWA, the Wine Spirit Wholesalers Association, all start playing nice with each other. Um, I think this pandemic has uh, really forced people to have to sort of let bygones be bygones a very old english thing to say but you know let bygones be bygones and just get on with all trying to help each other um it's not really a high point but something that you know when it when you get those difficult days and we all have them in every single business it doesn't matter what it is is just the people um yeah it's me it made the beginning of this year, and it seems to be coming back in a bit now, a bit sad that I don't get to see all my buddies at the conferences and go visit their distilleries and stuff. But we talk a lot. Um, I probably spent three hours a day on the phone with other distilleries, exchanging information and helping each other, but just, you know, bullshitting, especially if we've had a whiskey as well. You know, <laughs> uh, you know remember the good old days, and we're going to get back to that. And that's... It's not one high point, but it's mm -hmm. maybe the high point of the whole thing is just the people. And um, I, I laugh at distributors. I've met some great distributors. I think the system's wrong, but I don't think the people in that are wrong at all. Mm -hmm. Suppliers, distributors, and retailers. I, I do miss being on the road, going into a bar, introducing them to our whiskey, and you know, seeing it on the back shelf next time I go there. Yeah, that, yeah. That the, is, the, the distribution system is like it is like a farm. It it creates its own bullshit, and it's its oh, own yeah. fault for the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think what you're saying is, is one of the things I, I find awesome when I when I was doing sales, an interpersonal reaction with someone and getting them to purchase it and going back to see the next time that you were all on the same page when you left. Because sometimes when you're doing a sale, people will agree to things, and then afterwards. They're not necessarily telling you the the, the upfront, yeah. upfront answer to what's going on. Is like, I'll buy it. No, it's in the back corner over here, away from everything else. Yeah. Like, but that's the third bar. That's not even what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and they say things like, "Well, it's not moving. Well, it's, take it out of the locked up cage at the back of the bar." Yeah, you yeah. Know? Where, where people think it's like eight hundred, you know, two hundred dollars yeah. an ounce. You take it out of that one. Um, why, is, why is it at calf height behind the counter where nobody can yeah. see it? <laughs> there you go. Uh, but AJ Lopez yeah. in the chat, he was wondering if you ever considered doing a collaboration with Jared at Balcones. Now, oh. I know you did something similar to that, and I was going to bring this up anyways with Lost Lantern, 
but I think there was a couple more people involved. In you know, I, I, I led the, the rest of that. Really message. It was something, <laughs> something, like doing, something like doing a wife swap I, any day. I, I'm upstairs and I don't think she can hear me anytime, Jared. I think she does massage. I, I'm in. But actually, it, it's weird when you said that. I wanted to talk about yep. this thing. And I'm going to hold it up. Uh, that, that looks well loved. Yeah. yeah that, oh yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, there's not much left. Um, huh? I'm gonna come over here. I think I've got a reflection. Can I get that? Hey, you're all good. I'd say so pulling you, back a little bit, but yeah, it's your lost lantern release. That's perfect. Yeah. So Adam Polinsky is a writer. Or used to be a writer for the Whiskey Advocate, and I think he still writes. He and his wife Nora Ganley Roper. They are Lost Lantern, and I'll, I'll tell you who's on here. It's um, Balconis, Copper Works, Santa Fe Spirits, Triple Eight, Virginia, and Westwood. Mm -hmm. And those are all a great bunch of yeah. you know, distillers. Um, so we have collaborated like that. I love listening to Jared talk about whiskey. He's very enthusiastic. I think Balconis do a, a wonderful job of making all kinds of whiskeys. One of my favorite, I think it's Bruchera they do, which is a sherry cask oh, finish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I like ours, but I really like theirs as well. Um, and um, Joe is just a, a good old guy that, uh, well, he's a lot younger than me, <laughs> a good guy that uh, um, makes some great whiskey. He's got a great team. Balconis is one of those lucky distilleries that stayed independent. Uh, I forget the name of the owner of the whole thing, but he's he's willing to let them spread their wings. You know, Chip Tate started a great thing, yep. but I, I do think they've um, they've really taken it to new heights, yeah. really under Jared's direction. So, uh, it, you know, swapping distillers, I'm more the the sales end of thing, and Jared's more the distilling end. So we don't we wouldn't really swap seats necessarily, but to swap distillers at the moment, it's it's difficult, obviously. But I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of thing coming up because um, we a lot of us are going to need to sort of partner together, maybe form alliances to survive this thing. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, I think um, yeah. it's a challenge all around, but it's a great idea. And we all play so nicely together because we're all small enough to help that it's definitely something we could do. You couldn't do that with Diageo and Sazerac, you know, but yeah. you, you can with the craft distilleries, definitely. I, and I'll go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say I'll go ahead and plug that Lost Lantern there. I believe that today is available mm -hmm. on Sealbox. Mm -hmm. Yes, along yep, with a done. few other bottlings that they have. But yeah, that's that. If if you're somewhere that Sealbox will deliver, that is one to go for, guys. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice blend of American single malts, and we were talking about mm -hmm. that last time about how it's something that I think a lot of us we do at home. You know, like you have this and this and this, and you start playing and mixing and kind of putting together something. But yeah. seeing someone do it for real and, and having bo and actual bottles come out it is pretty sweet. And there's not a distillery in there I don't like. So it, no, they, all, they, it makes you feel better when you hear it. You're like, I like everybody. I like everybody. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah. everybody. And so this, yeah. this is going to be good. Kumbaya. Well, it was interesting for us the Lost Lantern. Um, we were at the, it was the ADI conference in Denver and he said, okay, I want you all to give us, you know, stay an extra day. We all drove out at 10 in the morning, had a, a lunch in the middle. And then, uh, I think lunch was crackers. We didn't want to kill our palates. It wasn't <laughs> something special. And it was fun. <laughs> but, you know, all six of us showed up and, uh, just mixed and matched. And we all had like samples and Che traded out. I think Lost Lantern are doing a wonderful job in a very craft way of um, letting the craft distillers mix it. Um, we all came up with our, you know, we all had two casks in and then we all had to pick at least one cask from each distillery that we thought had the nuances for this. We picked a better one. Then we went into blending in various forms. And um, gosh, who, who was there? There was Jason from Copperworks. Me from Santa Fe Spirits, Randy from Triple Eight, Gareth from Virginia, uh, Jared from uh, what you call it, Balconis. Oh, Christian from Westwood. Yeah. 
and um, just a great group of guys to hang out with. It was a, a good experience. I hope to um, I hope to be able to do that again. I really do. Yeah. I, and so I think what that... what what do you like about that whiskey? What's your favorite thing about that? Um, gosh, the experience so... or the flavors or what? Yeah. <sighs> It's got, for me, it's got so many layers. I can spot mine in there, sort of at the bottom, because mine smoked. And what I brought to the table was Apple Brandy cask finished okay. and a regular, oh. like a cask strength one. And the Apple Brandy cask finish worked in. It's a bit like when we were tasting the PX, or as we call yeah. it, called Keegan PX. It, it, it sort of, mine sunk to the bottom, a sort of more of a grounding note with the smokiness. And Randy's at triple eight seem to have more of the fruity note. They they were all in there in a layer, and it's like some of the. Um, it's not old in itself. I don't know what the average age in here is, but I'm guessing it's about three years, give or take. Now here in America, we, you know, we can age differently from Scotland because it's not so cold and so damp in most places. Maybe maybe yeah. Randy up in Massachusetts gets some of that, but not too much. <laughs> but, he ages for longer. I mean, I think he, his was a 10-year. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was interesting to see the layers sort of pull out. I think as a young whiskey, you can taste nuances a bit easier. Mm -hmm. In some of those, you know, I don't do it often, but 25-year-old scotches, it's all homogenized. It's great, and it, there's depth, but they're so subtle that they all... It's great to drink that kind of whiskey. This one is one that I can see the Culkegan at the bottom. I can see the Triple Eight at the top. I can see Copperworks in there. And Balcones, to me, has a lot of wood on everything, which I like. I think it's a good thing. I mean, you really know they use new wood on everything. Mm -hmm. And they really oversmoke. Well, not oversmoke. I've got to be careful. Jared will call me up any minute. <laughs> 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 they, they, they've got a lot of, you know, like their brimstone or something. You know. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, there, there's a whiskey. And it, it's not the one that was in here, but it was just, to me, it was interesting. Maybe because I knew what went into it. But when the bottle came, it was sort of like, ah, yeah. There's a lot of layers to that. It's definitely worth the price, but I think it's pricing it at 120 mm -hmm. It's uh, It's worth... Mm -hmm. Saving two weeks worth of whiskey money for, for one kind of thing, you know. <laughs> agree, I yeah. agree on that completely. Yeah. Oh, and and are they, um, oh. are you selling anything else through Lost Lantern or yeah. any <laughs> other avenues at this moment? <laughs> Funny you should say that. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Um, when Adam and Noah came through, we gave them a bunch of samples and they decided this one was one they wanted to release just as a Santa Fe Spirits blend. Nice. <clears throat> what they were doing was they were highlighting a few different ones. This is quite a smoky one. Mm -hmm. it, and you can sort of tell by the color. Yeah. It's quite, and that, that's through a whole bottle there. It's quite mm -hmm. light, um, which means it's aged in used bourbon casks. So the, that third of smoke on the, on the, the two row raw barley really holds up but it's what they wanted to do was highlight what santa fe spirits meant to them which is a smoky whiskey um if they did about i don't think they've got a balconis out but if they do one like that they'll probably push the oak forward because i think balconis mm -hmm. really have a nice balance of oak without overdoing it you're not chewing mm -hmm. on a piece of oak you know yeah. um i know the only other one i know of they did was iron root had a release too but I, I just thought it was another way for people to get their hands on your product um, well thank you what we're I trying to do I mean, yeah. <laughs> hey that that's that's an important thing it's like we were talking before not everyone has it or has a direct avenue to getting it so if you get seal yeah. box or lost lantern maybe you start getting to that you know 20 30 state range where you know yeah. if you can't get it from one maybe you'll be able to find it from another on a scale like that so i think that's yeah we we are looking at um working with um libdiv which carries in california um uh, we just applied for the new state license in illinois and florida okay so we're sort of going to scan ourselves it does add quite a bit because everybody needs to make a markup it's we, we jokingly call it indirect to consumer <laughs> it, goes, it goes from us to LibDiv to a wholesaler to a store that will sell it to you. So the markup's yeah. quite a bit, but, uh, you know, uh, if you really need craft whiskeys, it's a good way to go. 
And if, you know, these days nobody's looking, just call the distillery. We'll figure something out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, by the way. <laughs> call us at the distillery, we'll talk. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, so that was, a, that was a, not really a question. It's more of a comment. Is that I, would, I wish that with the smaller craft distilleries and, and with the maybe an expansion of the, 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 the single malt alliance, you know, being able to, to get everybody together to, to, I know you can't say that you would create your own distributorship because <laughs> you have to keep <laughs> the people that you've got, yeah. but to have an alliance with the, with the power to go to somebody, um, not, not necessarily seal box, but somebody like a seal box that, or somebody that would handle the shipping. So it's like, okay, we maybe you're limited to saying, all right, we can ship this many cases through this, but everything else has to go through normal channels. So at least it's more of a direct way for you guys to get out to consumers and yeah. and really, really be fair in the marketplace because the distributors, you know, I, and I don't mind saying it, they're not fair to you guys. They're not fair to, to small craft distilleries. Yeah. And the only way for business to be fair is for, you know, either level playing field, which they won't do, or allow you to, to do some sort of direct sales. Yeah, it's it is a challenge. I mean, I don't think with the system the way it is. I, to be honest, I, I'm from Santa Fe. We get very spiritual about everything. <laughs> but you, you, I, I really don't hold any particular distributor, at, at, you know, to task for this. The system, I think, is broken enough that in this modern day world, especially with things like COVID, meaning everybody's going to buy just online and do it easily. The system is going to break down, and I think if we can all work together to change it, you, you're right. It, it's not a level playing field. A distributor can't afford to carry craft spirits that are going to sell hundreds of cases in their state when they need that warehouse space <clears throat> and insurance coverage and people and trucking right. and infrastructure for the Jack Daniels, which will sell that much a day, you know. Right. Um, but if you let us get big enough by using direct to consumer shipping we don't we, we don't really want to do that we'd love to work in the three tier system it just is too big to work for us because we're small let, let us get to yeah. a size where you can cope with us you know? yeah, like, right so, i think mike was saying uh, is right where if you did have a coalition or an, an alliance of yeah. eight to ten people it's like well we we really only want the middle part of this shelf you know, yes. like we, we, we're not asking for a lot, right? It's eight yeah. people. You're, you're making eight people yeah. happy and you're putting all wonderful product on your shelf, you yeah. know, like as I don't know, that, that's that's just whiskey knowledge in general. And, and no, needs to be I shared. Yeah, yeah I totally it's, agree with you. And uh, between us chickens, because nobody's listening on the Internet. Ha ha. <laughs> nobody's listening. There's some discussions ongoing. Um, you've heard of the good guys distillers, I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, that, that sort of sprung out of ACSA. It's really a forum for sharing knowledge. Um, we're, we're talking about some options like that. Um, it's difficult because we're all just a little different. Mm -hmm. but we all used to think we were that much independent, but now we're all hurting so much. I'll give up my independence <laughs> to help me sell something, you know. Yeah. Mercenary we become, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's a whole had... other... Go ahead, Mike. Sorry? Oh, no. I, I, so a few weeks ago, we had uh, Gary from Wood Hat was back on. And, oh, yeah. And yeah. When, when he was talking about that, he's like, you know, you just call. You call a distributor. You call a distributor. And over time, they'll get tired of looking at that note with your name on it. And, and I don't disagree with that. But I, I think that's... I don't know that it's got almost a little too nice of how, it, how that could work. Cause they're yeah. just, they're, honestly, they're, they're really, you can just complain. It's just like, Oh, here's that asshole asking about Cole Keegan again. Yeah. And when, when really, like you, like you said, they're, they're going to push, they're going to push Jack Daniels there, or they're going to base somebody else's uh, whiskey. It's like, Oh, well they, you know, I'm going to give him all this stuff. And, and cause they're buying all this white claw too. And they're buying all this <laughs> other crap. And so we're not, you know, you know, we don't have room for your stuff because, you know, we've pushed all these other things and, yeah. and it's really, it's too bad. I mean, it, it is, it, it is. Um, yeah, it's, I know I basically, I'd agree. It's difficult for, you know, retailers and, uh, Oh, somebody, Emily Chambers said yeah. coalition uh, might have better legal potential. Yeah. She, she's our, I would she, agree. She is our, uh, our legal assistant. 
Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go, Emily. That was a great comment. No, I, I think it's right that, you know, when you, when you get to a size, you can command some interest. Not, Carl Keegan's not for everybody. There's a smoke hint at the back. And people go, oh, I can't do smoke. I think it's a soft, soft nuance. But It, it hey, is compared to other, oh, other yeah, people yeah. choke it, you out, man. That's yours. It doesn't nice. smack you around the back of the head with a two-by-four like some of the Scotch <laughs> yeah. whiskeys do. But um, actually, they don't call it a two-by-four. They call it a 15-millimeter by 30-millimeter. <laughs> splitting heads. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know... It, so, yeah, I, Cole Keegan's for, for some, but not for everybody. But if we could be part of a set, we are so tiny in the scheme of whiskey. I mean, I, I would, you know, I, I, I don't know what Jack Daniels sells per day. And Jack Daniels is just the easiest name to go to. Mm, they, yeah. there was, they make great, I think it's a good whiskey. I think they're all, you know, all the guys make good whiskey. But um, we, we looked at direct to consumer shipping. And then one of the problems was, or oh, sorry, fe sorry, federal excise tax reduction, getting all my acronyms mixed up. <laughs> People said, well, this is helping big business. But for Jack Daniels, that's four days of production, 100,000 gallons, yeah. Yeah. Or whatever that is in cases. For me, that's, you know, five years. <laughs> so you yeah. put a few, you know, you put eight of us together and we equal in a year's sales what Jack Daniels does in two weeks, you know, and it's eight different, completely different products. So mm -hmm. I, I do think, you know, um, there's going to be a necessity for trying to think outside the box. And I think this is going to be a great chance if we can hang on long enough. And I really mean that to, to take advantage of it, you know, yeah. we just hope so, people start, yeah. uh, Paying better attention to to a better whiskey, and it's and it's worth buying at, at that point. When, you, when you're saying it's out there, I'm like, yeah, but there's there's quality differences uh, that that are yeah. a distinct difference in everything. Yeah. And this is the last one of this I'm going to pour because I think I'm getting kind of antsy with it. So we're going to put this <laughs> we're going to put this bottle over here. Um, now we are getting close to an hour, and I do see we have some people left in the chat. So anyone who's oh, yeah. left in the chat should make a comment or just say that I'm here because I'm going to write down some names and I'm going to give away a couple of samples of the set that uh, we have of, of the Cole Keegan here at the end of the show, just so two people out there can, can try the whole gambit of everything and see if what we're saying is true because I know I'm right. So I know we're saying the truth. <laughs> um, well, why don't each of the three of you pick somebody who's got what you think is one of the best comments Send me the oh. address, and I'll send a bottle oh. of their of their choosing from any one of the four. You know, oh. they're, they're, there's an idea to spark some interest and get some comments. She's, oh well, Jesus Christ! Look at that! There, all of a sudden, I'm here is popping up. Jeff comes over there. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm here. That's a great question. Oh, you get a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, yeah, just let me know, and I'll, I'll send a few bottles out happily. Okay, well, I was gonna say, let's see who's overly out there. generous. That yeah is overly generous, and you have been because I was willing, I was just gonna send out a, a sample set of everything, and I think that would make most people happy. So that is over and above, Colin, and thank you. And yeah. I'm sure. That, I mean, I can't send four bottles to everybody, but no. I can send one bottle to a few people. No, no, that would that would yeah. be <laughs> that would be that would be crazy. You're you're already way too generous in general, and and we can't thank you enough for for yeah. how you've treated us it, it's, it's been ridiculous um now let's see here well, let's we'll take three or four we got oscar ice house spencer madison i'll do something here and we'll see which one of the the two people win in the chat i'll be i'll be right back i just don't want to hear everyone talking into my phone about numbers for a second so give me a second and i'll be right back <laughs> So, ben, Mike, so we can talk. We can talk about him now. Sure. Ask me a question. Yeah, we can. So, are are you gonna are you gonna stay focused on single malt as a base, or are you gonna move into anything else? Um, I really like to stay focused on single malt. Um, I I think it's where we can shine. Um, at the moment, 
we have no tasting rooms, of course, because everything is shut down. But vodkas are an important part of our makeup, even though we don't make it. Gin, gin's actually still our biggest volume seller, not our biggest margin, dollar margin. Um, if if I could, I just move over to be in a whiskey house. But forty percent of our income is from those two tasting rooms, so we have to keep them with all kinds of spirits in there at the moment. So you, with the uh, is with the pandemic. I mean, it's not going away anytime soon. No, it's not. No. Um, are you are you looking at at changing something or adding something to the portfolio because <laughs> of the pandemic? Yes, we've. Uh, I I should have bought some of those up. We've got a. Um, we call it a Mesquite Manhattan. Technically, it's a. It's actually a Rob Roy. It's a. Um, it's a Manhattan made with Scotch. Oh, mm. I say Scotch, single malt. Sorry, God, now I'm falling into that trap of Scotch. <laughs> but, um, that that's doing very well. We've got to get formula approval, then label approval. So it'll be a while because the government's not working as fast, obviously, because of you know people working remotely. Um, yeah. We do a, uh, a Negroni with our gin, which is doing very well. We, we can sell it locally without label approval within the state, but as soon as we go out of the state, we can't. So ready to drink or RTDs, as I'm sure you've heard of. Um, that's our latest pivot. So, yeah, we're, we're expanding the line a little bit there. Okay. Are there some other projects in the work coming down the road you want to talk um, about or share? I think I said it a while ago. And I, I can't remember if it was here or not. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it, it all blends together. Um, we've got six casks of unsmoked Colkegan. So there's no mesquite. It's just a pure single malt. Um, because of the reduced staffing at the moment, um, that's sort of just getting older and older, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is not a bad thing. It's evaporating a bit, but it's getting older and older. We're going to pull that and see... Uh, it'll be like the PX release, you know, to see if we uh, get some good feedback. And if it does, we'll make some, but that will be would be three years out before we'd release it. Um, so okay. things like that. Yeah. Um, we've got some people that want some private labels. Um, and th that's a double-edged sword. It, it's instant income, but it really cuts into your production time and uses up equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to avoid that, but I think once you get into it, you've got to go into it whole hog and maybe have just pull Carl Keegan off to the side and then do private labels for people. It's it's a weird time, and all the distillers are having the same conversations as we are. Sorry, all the craft distillers, anyway. Are there any chance you guys will get with a <laughs> online distributor like a... I, I don't... Well not a big fan of caskers and flaviar <laughs> but but one you know one of those to to get more stuff out or is that really it, hard to do uh no we're actually with uh flaviar uh, mm -hmm. at the moment if you get um one of their little you know three bottle kits in that nice round package they've got um okay. i don't know how they I, to be honest i haven't really followed them they they buy three or 400 gallons of whiskey from us a year um, and put it into mm. some of those kits. They repackage it um, at a, a plant in Texas and um, that's doing well for us. And what they do then okay. is they promote it. We sell to Libdiv, an online reseller out of California that resells it. It's It, it means that a, our 60, uh, sorry, $50 bottle of regular Colkegan ends up at a $75 mark, $75 price tag, um, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate, but it means you can still get it. I'd love to get it out. If, if we could sell online, we could cut that $50 bottle to 45 okay. If we could sell directly instead of 75 But, you know, the system is what it is. Yeah. That is very true. All right, now. Questions? No, well, I was going to say, Ice House and Spencer Mav, uh, well, between the people, one what, what you offered up, we weren't expecting. So I'll get their emails and we'll we'll figure that out. Yeah, now, definitely. Now I I still have two sample sets sitting here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna round out two other names from people that are left, and uh, and you, uh, 
I'll send you a sample set, or Mike will. We'll, we'll get something set up, but we'll, we'll get a couple more people here. I so I see AJ still left in the chat. I see Emily Chambers. I see Red is in it. A couple other people. Um, give me one more second, and we'll do another little quick drawing, and we'll 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 get emails from people, and we'll okay. we'll send out some sample, uh, some of our samples to those people, um, yeah. and take care of that. But I, something I will need, and I promise I'll just tear it up straight away. If we have, we need to need the mailing address, we do need a phone number. Yep. Of the person receiving it, I tried putting my phone number in, and people didn't send me their phone number for samples, and it triggers something within FedEx yes. that sends the package back. Yes, it does. <laughs> I may have done it's, that too on accident yeah. one time, and I'm not going to be trolling up, you know. <laughs> Calling in the middle of the night and saying, "Hey, it's me, calling the call game. We will we'll send you a bottle and throw the address away. Don't worry. <laughs> I think that would be better. You should call up like a week later and be like, "Hey, I'm wondering what you thought. What do you think of the whiskey? What, <laughs> tell me about the whiskey. It's two o'clock in the morning. Tell me about the whiskey. <laughs> I haven't opened it yet. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, I'm coming around to open it for you." <laughs> <laughs> Colin will personally come to your house and open the whiskey with you. It's <laughs> but uh, uh, like I said, we, we're coming up on an hour. We don't want to keep you horribly long. We appreciate you so much. You coming on and just spending some time with us every time. And it's how I enjoy this. <laughs> hey, we we always enjoy having a few drinks and talking to people. And you have been really pushing a forefront for a long time. You have been involved in whiskey groups and stuff like that for forever and really kind of pushing part of it forward, especially with the, the single malt and everything like that. So we want people to know about you. And when they have a chance to go out and see you on a shelf or go to a website like Sealbox or something, you know, go in and pick up a bottle. We're not lying. You're going to be happy. So yeah. not. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, and Spencer says he is down for a phone call anytime you want to call him. <laughs> he's totally fine with that. He's going to be totally okay with that. I'll have, uh, I love talking whiskey. I'll call anybody. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it now, looks seriously, like I did just while well, we got two seconds with, with a few people on the line. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to support craft distilleries is to go buy one of their bottles. Not just mine. A lot of times in a lot of yeah. states, you can't get mine. If you've got a local craft distiller, you buying a bottle puts a lot more money in their pocket than, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you can go, to, if you're in a state that you can go to their tasting room, that's great. Um, yeah. it, it's a challenge for everybody at the moment and not mm -hmm. just in the distilling world, it, it's everywhere. But um, if you need a bottle of whiskey and you can afford an extra few dollars, it, it does typically cost a few more. It makes a big difference to your distiller, I, I guarantee it. Yeah, and I think Mike hit on this previously in, in a previous episode. But if if you can make it to the distillery mm. and purchase yeah, so straight from the distillery, that. do yeah. that, do that. And obviously, if you can't, and you can find it at a local shop or something, by all means. However, get it yeah, there's, there's there's always somebody doing a road trip. Yeah, thanks, Ben. No, there is. Yeah, I appreciate it, Ben. Thank you for saying that. It's um, yeah. buying it direct from the distillery, and a lot of people are just doing curbside. We run out with a mask on. Swipe a credit card, get put it in your trunk, and we'll, off you go. Yeah. All right. Now the last two people to win sample sets are AJ Lopez and Texas Lady. So I know you guys. I I think you have our emails. You know how to get a hold of us. Please do. I'll send you out a sample set of them. Um, just because they are really really nice, and we want to want to share stuff with the with fans that are watching and get you guys to start tasting some of the whiskeys we're doing so yeah. hopefully in the future when we have people like Colin on we might have already distributed some whiskeys like that samples so that you can have them in hand when we're having a show like yeah. this future yeah. maybe yeah. maybe next year we don't want to i don't want to get too excited too early but that sounds like <laughs> a, i think a, i think you need to say shared or rehomed re re I, like, I like that rehomed business <laughs> yeah. rehomed re yeah. all right <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's that's what that's what we're aiming for. So we can kind of encompass more people in the experience we're having, yeah. something like this, because this this is some really fantastic stuff. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. So 
Thank you, everyone in the chat for coming in. We really appreciate it. Colin, thank you for stopping in. This we, we always enjoy having you on, and we'll, yeah. we love having you back. And we'll probably we'll probably nag you a few more times just to come back. Oh, please you, do. You, you have your fingers dipped into a lot of stuff, and, and you have a lot of great stories. So we're always happy to hear them. It, so. It's better than doing the dishes on a Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we get you out of trouble like that, we're we're okay with. Oh that. yeah, yeah. No, sorry, honey. This is work. <laughs> honest. <laughs> So you get, remember, it's not the size of the den that matters. It's the love of whiskey. Cheers, Thanks. everyone out there. Cheers. 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 Salute. Yeah, so you look good. You seem good. Thank you. You may have... Uh... Ten years, man. Ten. Where have you been for ten years? Let's get into it. One, two, three. <laughs>